By the end of the century, disasters caused by environmental hazards will be a threat to the national security of Jamaica and the Caribbean. Already the region is dealing with the early onslaught of these types of disasters, from drought to flooding, tidal and storm surges, to intense winds caused by tropical storms that are increasing in strength. The impacts of climate change for the Caribbean region, many and varied, we know a lot about the impacts of the eventual increasing intensity of storms. It seems very likely that the storms that we will have in the future will be much stronger in terms, especially in terms of the wind intensity, and that in turn impacts the storm surges and likely the associated precipitation that will accompany these storms. With that kind of impact, clearly there is much that people need to do to prepare. Also, the increased intensity of the storms with changes in the rainfall patterns that are likely to occur in the future. The Caribbean needs to implement long-term adaptation steps to meet the challenge posed by global warming. Time is running out. Some of these rainfall patterns, even though we will likely be very much drier by the end of the century, but drier does not mean that we will not have rain. In fact, we'll probably go into a very variable period and then go into the dry. In that variability, we would likely see some of the things that we begin to see manifesting now, which are very intense but shorter periods of rainfall, and that has great consequences for flooding. So you're putting a lot of water on the ground over a short space of time. And so the impacts of flooding will be there, even as we try to tackle the impacts of drought due to the overall lessening of, of rainfall. Um, so the wind, the rainfall, intense rainfall, even amidst drier, and of course the warming that we should expect with the rising temperatures due to global warming. Some communities across Jamaica have taken on the task of implementing adaptation steps to meet the projected impact climate change will have on them. Two such communities are Woodford and Cascade, located in the Blue and John Crow Mountains. Farming communities, the residents of Woodford and Cascade have been experiencing intense bouts of rainfall and high winds which have resulted in the loss of crops and land slippage. We're inside the shop there and you just hear this big rumbling sound when everyone ran outside. There was this big boulder in the middle of the road. So you see all the people in the shop, it could have been right down and hit, turn, hit the shop and all. Everyone would die. Our community was having constant breakaways when the rain falls and it has been causing a lot of problems to get back and forth out of the community. We were encouraged through our group and JCDT that protective farming could be a solution. So we got some aid from JCDT to UNDP to direct this structure. The aim of the project was to address climate change adaptation as well as soil erosion within the communities of Woodford and Cascade. These communities have been affected um, by the incidence of, of soil erosion over several years and the project was geared at looking at methods in which to reduce those, those impacts to the communities. The problems that we saw, and notably so, has been droughts, long period of droughts, 
farming communities have been complaining about their crops, soil erosions, and as such we decided to intervene and really our projects are replicable and we saw the Woodford and Cascade are two communities that can be used as examples locally. The main problem that they had was slash and burn. A lot of communities we found were doing the slash and burn, which is, it doesn't really help. Some of the innovative um, techniques, like the sloping, um, planting certain trees, native trees, so for as reforestation and soil stabilization, that has been very good. We have planted the pines in two rows. The first row is about three feet, up, feet apart, followed by the second row in between where the spaces are left up in another row distance apart. So as to keep the land, the water don't just flow through and run. It is barred and the, the debris will fall to build up also. So it keeps the land from tearing. When this row is planted, the space that will be left between two plants in front will plant the row, the, the second row, in between the spaces. They have embraced greenhouse farming and it's they're trying to replicate it among other communities because the yields from crops have been so remarkable. You can actually program a tree like that to do as much as you want because you can actually prune that tree. They tend to go much taller and if they are well fed then you get more because it has more body of a tree. Outside it's because it is it is limited to um, what you give it. It gets any kind of sun, any kind of rain, there's no way you can limit that. And so therefore it, it is left to take what it wants and do what it, it feels like being out here best. Woodford is within the Blue and Drunk Mountain National Park area, which is an area we work with a lot. And we think that, the, again, the involvement of the community is critical to any successful project. And the fact that they are doing the, the groundwork of planting the trees, maintaining the trees, which is almost as, if not more important than planting them, is a big part of the, the work that they're doing. Um, and so we have supported projects such as those which have done reforestation. We have had alarming statistics of the reforestation rates in Jamaica and we can only hope that we're making a difference. Final evaluation was done on the project recently and the outcomes were very, very impressive. Persons who they thought would never ever participated in the project, they are now seeing the benefits and have impl implemented a lot of measures plus they have gotten additional community members and even external community members and adjoining communities to participate and change their ways of how they do farming. Another community taking proactive steps to adapt to the challenge of climate change is Bunkers Hill, located in the parish of Trelawney. This farming community has had an ongoing problem of losing crops and being unable to reach their farms due to flooding during heavy rains. This area is really a a farming area wherein we have a lot of farmers to do a bit of yam here. We have a lot of mixed farming done here also. When we first received the concept, we saw the problem as being bigger than CBA project. However, based on our mandate in supporting communities, we thought that this is something that we'd really participate in. What the problem is they're having is their livelihoods are being threatened by flooding. Whenever the rain falls, there's a bridge that they need to use to access their farm and it's been flooding all over to the part where it's threatening homes along the riverbanks and so forth. When the rain falls, this place is completely flooded. Covered. Covered. 
If you could see the bridge here, that bridge, when the rain falls, the bridge cannot take the volume of water. So it come up here to the railing and it push back the water across here. Nobody can go over there. We couldn't be, we couldn't be standing here now and the van and the vehicle could not be parked here. We are part of the lower cockpit country. When the upper cockpit country, talking about St. Elizabeth, Manchester, um, and so on, when flooding takes place, most of the water comes down into this valley, including chemicals that is harmful. Now we have what you call an Artesian, um, Artesian Valley Basin. It means to say all the water sits down into a basin here. So we have to protect the Martha Bray watershed system and ecosystem. You understand? We have to do that. And the only way we can do that is to make sure that we protect all the tributaries that come into here from the different areas comes into the system. Most of the water that goes to Montego Bay, all the way to Hanover, to Ryabuna and places like that comes into the system. So we have to protect that in terms of climate change. So when we have extensive flooding, we can't stop that. But in a normal course, we can divert some of the water and make sure the people's livelihood are protected. When, when the bridge is blocked and the, the, the whole place is covered with water, can I come across or can I get to a farm, produce like these, have to stay there and spoil. So it's a big loss to us that we, we, we really need the bridge. The, 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 Place to be fixed. Despite the delays of the project, we are still going on because in implementing, you know, there are changes and deviations, and that's what that's where we are. But in any case, we see see those things as lessons learned. So the delay in implementing the project is beneficial. The National Works Agency ensured that the community prepared the relevant drawings and documentation, went through the feasibility study and gotten the OK or the approval for them to go ahead. And this is one of the projects that, you know, has been recognized and been looked at globally because obviously a lot of co other communities, not just nationally, are having the same challenge and they really want to see how we are tackling it. So we're looking forward to that at the end of the project. The culverts have been here for at least a year courtesy of UNDP. What we intend to do is to use two rows of culverts under and across the roadway so that we can divert at least half of the water from the infrastructure of the bridge. The Bunkers Hill project um, is a nice example of the, the, the interaction between livelihoods and environment and what they're doing there is trying to control what is happening in the environment because of climate change um, in a way that is useful to their livelihoods and, and useful to everybody in the area. So where, where the water is coming in and, and going to potentially do damage to, to farms and other areas, um, we hope that we're playing a role in making a positive contribution and making an environmentally sensible change um, and mitigation in terms of what is needed for climate change. If we're looking at some of these impacts going towards the end of the century, these impacts will not just suddenly occur at the end of the century. In fact, we begin to see some of these things happening now and the changes will continue to happen as we go towards the end of the century. It therefore means that we can't wait um, to begin to prepare for these things. We know this is going to happen. Um, we are beginning to see the, the impact of, of climate change. We need to make appropriate actions to prepare for climate change, and we have to do that now. Finding the best action in itself is a, can be a time-consuming thing, um, and when we find some of the, the good actions, they take time to be implemented, and of course, time to, to mature, and for us to see that these are in fact the best actions that we can take. So adaptation is, is one of the things that we have to do 
we have to realize that this is the context within which we are going to live and so we have to adapt and we have to adapt now. This is part of some of the research that is being done. The research is, is trying to show what are the impacts, link these impacts to society, link these impacts to various sectors, to agriculture, to communities, to water sector, to the built environment. Once we know those linkages, then we can begin to formulate these kind of adaptation actions and we can begin the process of finding ways to implement these adaptation actions, but bearing in mind that we have to begin that implementation process from the present and then tailor or change or continue as we go into the future. Community-based adaptation projects are the key to anything successful with environmental management because the communities are the ones that are relating to the environment, involved with the environment, and are going to continue to be the main, main point of contact with the environment, no matter what happens in the future. Time to adapt. No location is safe from the impact of climate change, not even environmentally protected areas. Declared a protected area in 1999, Portland Bight constitutes a number of traditional fishing communities that contain some of the island's best examples of coastal dry forest, the longest contiguous mangrove coastline in Jamaica, and some very important fish nurseries. The Portland Bight's protected area was declared by order of the government under the NRC Act in 1999. Behind me is a map of the area, and within the boundary of the rope here is the Hesha Hills, Immediately below me is the Portland Ridge, this is Brazileta Mountains, and this is the Rio Mino. All the communities in between are included in the Portland Bay Protected Area, so it includes most of Southern Clarendon and Southern St. Catherine and out to sea. The Caribbean Coastal Air Management Foundation, or CCAM for short, is an environmental and development NGO that has been working in the area from as early as 1995. We've been working through the process of co-management with all the stakeholders. So we work with community groups, we work with local government, we work with central government to plan and implement projects and programs to conserve the resources of the area and to improve the livelihoods of the persons that live there. Portland Bight has always been challenged with the climate variability and risk. And because of the livelihoods that are at risk, more namely the Fisher Folk, the UNDP chief CBA intervenes and we have no regrets so far because it serves a wide community. Most of the Portland Black communities are coastal communities and they are vulnerable to the impact of storm surge from hurricanes mostly because of their, their proximity to the coastline. Portland Bight was one of the first places that was awarded fish sanctuaries. They have three fish sanctuaries within the Portland Bight area. And CCAM, the group that's working in the area, is doing exceptional work with the design of the management plans for the three fish sanctuaries, as well as the, the sharing of knowledge with the people in the area, again, on the ground, doing the work. And we have been very impressed with what they've been able to find out, the fact that they've kept the fishermen and the other people who have livelihoods in the area involved and that they've made it a, a very participatory process. More recently, the area has been impacted by more frequent hurricanes, more frequent storms, and there is now more talk about climate change and the impact of climate change on the resources and the livelihoods of persons that live in the area. So in 2009, we approached the UNDP for a grant to implement a climate change adaptation project. Through that project and through the discussions with the community, we have been reviewing EIAs that developers take to the communities. We have also been doing community monitoring training so that community members can monitor the changes in the resources. So let us say that there is a flood. They will take photographs of before the flood, during the flood and after the flood so we can compare what's happening. 
They're looking at where they're seeing crocodiles. They're looking at where they're losing their beaches. They're looking at a number of things. So for us, the work that we do in Portland Bay definitely is figuring out how to include the community persons. How, how can we have to empower them to be able to make a difference in their own lives? And at the same time, including the agencies that have responsibility, ODPEM, Parish Council, NEPA, Forest Department, Fisheries Division, so that they can all come to the table and look at the solutions for the concerns and issues that are raised by the community persons. The theme of the project is public awareness, but it also addresses other areas such as livelihood components. Because in being one of the challenges in the area was that persons don't know what climate change means, how it's going to impact them and what to do. As it rel relates to climate change and the issues that are faced by the community, storm surge is one of the main issues that persons face, especially in the communities of Old Harbour Bay, Portland Cottage and Salt River. However, there is also land-based flooding as a result of rainfall for two weeks or three weeks at a time. And so what we're trying to do is work with the persons, work with the agencies, try and look at solutions as to what persons would do in the event of a storm surge or flooding in the area. They wouldn't need to know where the shelters are, when they need to evacuate, where they need to evacuate to, who is the shelter manager, is a bus going to come, all of these issues that they would need to know. We have tried to work with the agencies to provide them with that information. Recently, the persons from Portland Cottage came to us talking about the level of mangrove damage that they had in the area and that you wanted to do some mangrove replanting. Yes. Can you tell us why you wanted to replant the mangroves? What was the impact in the community? Why you thought it was necessary to do that? Before the hurricane, we have many people in the community cutting the mangroves and are using the red mangroves to make dye to steam their floors. And that caused the red mangroves to die out. So we decided that Without the mangroves, we will be exposed more to sea surge and hurricane. So we decided that we want to do some mangrove planting, and we negotiate with several people concerning the mangroves to get back mangroves planting in the community, especially when we have our workshop with Panos. We put it as our main source that we want to take place in our community, planting of the mangroves to help with the sea surge, because we know that the mangroves held back the water. What I noticed people live in the areas where the crocodiles used to be. So um, basically you now people are seeing them more because they're nearer to them. They cut down the mangroves and you know, they kind of come out in the water calling them and they have this it's like this are actually crocodiles Sundays. So Nigel, you're a fisherman. Tell us how the fish catch me. We're not catching the amount of fish that we use to catch and we're not catching the size of fish that we use. So what do you think about that? Global fishing is one of them. People do catch it coming out of shore now with some little fish like even this. And they do all they can, no matter how, as you know, I am a, a water and when I'm there, you will see them. But if you go to somebody's house, you see them with some little thing you wonder how people really catch them, they call it and uh, fries, they call it, you know, you see. And when I was a boy, my father used to be a fisherman as well. And then I've never seen those type of fish. The key outcome of the project is that a management development plan will be developed for the communities. It will be circulated in schools, organizations, communities, just about everybody within the community and by extension communities national in other areas of the part of the country who have similar problems. Working with rural communities, participation is 100%. The major challenge for them, their financial resources is so limited, as well as their limited capacity. But our strategy is to help them. We are working with community groups by choice. I, they are the ones doing the work on the ground. 
But there is still an issue of capacity. They don't have the accountant that, that we are able to hire or the, the technical expert. Um, they can ask for some of their services and in fact, of course, within our grants, we're able to provide some of that support. But the actual details of, of doing that every day, full time, um, is something that is still new and something that they have to grow into. So that capacity strengthening is always a challenge. Having said that, that is one of the roles that we do um, as a donor in, in the sector, which is to try and support groups to be able to manage what they have. Many of the adaptation measures will take time to mature. When you plant mangroves, they require time to grow. We know climate change impacts are real and they are coming. Some argue the region is already experiencing these impacts. Therefore, the time to start implementing effective systems is now. Now is the time to adapt.